Hello everyone and welcome back for some more freshly brewed drag tea. Today I have with me a legend in the Australian drag scene who entertained us with her big personality and infectious humour on season two of Drag Race Down Under. I'm super excited for you all to get to know her better and learn more about her amazing journey in drag. We'll of course be talking all things Drag Race and I'll be asking some of the amazing questions you all sent in. Please join me in welcoming the always fabulous Minnie Cooper. Hello, oh, how are you? I prefer to say the super duper Minnie Cooper. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't introduce you in the correct way. <laughs> there is a way, there is a way. <laughs> how are you? Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm good today. I'm a bit tired today, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, but generally I'm pretty good. You're always perfectly honest. I think we can always expect that from Mini Cooper. Well, apparently someone said on Reddit, apparently well, uh, apparently, I was the most talked about queen on Reddit, by the way. I don't know necessarily if that's a good thing, but a friend told me that Mini Cooper is too, even too honest for reality television. <laughs> I, was like, I mean, oh, wow. I mean, yeah, Reddit is is certainly interesting. So, but I thought you were fun. I really liked you on the show. I thought you were really entertaining, and you were very unfiltered and raw. And I think I appreciated that. And I think a lot of other people did because you weren't trying to play to the camera or whatever. You were just being your authentic self, which is what we want. I know a lot of people asked me that question. They said, "Did you plan to do?" It? I said, "None of that. That was planned." I said, "I just went in." The- the one thing I did say I was going to be honest, like I was just going to speak my truth in the moment. And I don't know necessarily if that is a good thing in retrospect. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Yes, well, we could, I will, I mean, we have lots of questions about that, so we can get to that uh, a little bit later. Um, I guess what would be really interesting was if you could sort of talk a little bit about how you got started in drag, because I know you've been doing drag for quite a while. So how you sort of got started in drag, where the name came from as well. Well, I actually, I've been around drag queens since I was 19 because my boyfriend used to choreograph all the Mardi Gras parties and the Mardi Gras shows. So I'd been around drag all my 20s, but I worked in musical theatre from 18 to 31. And I used to choreograph the drag shows for the drag queens. And Chelsea Bunn, who owns the House of Priscilla here in Australia, uh, she was looking for someone to fill in at the King's Cross Hotel and I was in between jobs and I thought, oh, yeah, she asked me, I filled in and 20 years later I'm still in between jobs. <laughs> well, I, I don't think you're in between jobs. I think you do an amazing job and I think we've all seen that now. So. Yeah, like I always joke about that, but I, I always thought, because, you know, a lot of dancers go into drag and they say, oh, it's just because their, their careers didn't take off in their their careers but for me I really do believe this is what I'm meant to be doing is be a drag queen I really do think it's what I'm meant to be doing I would 100% agree I think you've definitely you're so entertaining and like I mean Rue said you're a superstar and you've got that sort of like talent and everyone just you've got that warmth and energy and you're so funny so I, I can see that totally for you yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, well, I think I'm pretty funny most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd all agree. And I guess Reddit also agrees if you're the most talked about queen. So. Yeah, I know. I won an award for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously, Mini Cooper is a really sort of interesting name and funny because it's also a car, obviously. So where did that sort of come from? Well, when I started doing drag, I had, my first name was Anna Friend. So you'd say RuPaul Anna Friend. And I thought, oh, that's not really a stage name. And then I saw Minnie Mouse when I was having lunch on the wall. And I thought, oh, I just watched The Italian Job and I love Minnie Cooper cars. So I thought, oh, Minnie Cooper, what a great name. It's like, just like, and it's timeless, really. Like, it's such, a, I think it's a fabulous name. It is a fabulous name. And it also, like you said, is different connotations to it because of the car and also Minnie Mouse and stuff. So I think it definitely works. And also for your personality, because obviously I think Mini Coopers, the cars have a, a reputation for being sort of, they're small but mighty. And like, do you know what I mean? It's, it's got that kind of, it's not like calling yourself like Land Rover or I don't know, something maybe. Oh, no. Well, there is a drag queen in Sydney called Porsche Turbo. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. You wouldn't want to call it like Kia Rio, though, or like the car I actually own, a Suzuki Alto. Thank you. <laughs> I think Mini Cooper sounds a bit more fabulous. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so obviously, you know, I think the way you've been known for so long in, in the Australian drag scene in general, and then obviously I think an international audience got to know you even more through Drag Race. Mm. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the audition process, how you got involved in Drag Race, and also whether you were 
asked to be on season one? Because I, I think a lot of people were expecting you to be. Yeah, I was asked to be on season one, but when we had the interviews, they were through Skype, obviously, and I was very reserved in my interview if I was going to, because I thought it was going to be for House of Drag, not for Drag Race, because they didn't tell us what it was for. And when people are not being honest with you, because I'm, as you can see, I'm a pretty honest person, I sense a sense of distrust. So when I, I don't think I did a great audition for my first audition, because I think I was very guarded. So, and then when um, it came around for the second time, we were actually in the middle of the pandemic when we did our auditions and I was stuck in my home and I was like, and I really had trouble filming my audition, but then I had a friend who had a studio and I paid them to do my audition tape, which I was very happy with. And I did it like even over a couple of days, like seven days. Wow. I found the audition video actually quite easy to be honest. Yeah, I've heard that from other queens that about season one. So I've interviewed um, Anita Wiglet and Coco Jumbo, who were on season one, and they both said that they didn't realise it was for Drag Race because they didn't tell them. Um, yeah. And a lot, a lot of people did expect you, like Coco Jumbo said specifically, she expected you to be on because you're such a legend in the Australian drag scene. So, And I'm, I'm pretty glad I was on season two because I, I think with season one, I think as when I saw them not being very filtered with their personalities, that's why I decided to go on and be have not have a filter, which I don't know if that played to my strength or not, to be honest. Well, I think it did. I think you I think you would have easily fit in season one. And I think you obviously also brought the drama and the intrigue for season two. So I think yeah. it worked out. Certainly got the drama. <laughs> um <laughs> And so when you, you know, you walk in on the first day, you, you obviously you get on Drag Race and you walk in. What did it feel like walking into the workroom on that first day? Oh, that was my my first two days there with my favourite days of Drag Race, to be honest, because I was just having the time of my life because I was just excited to be there. I actually, I didn't care if I won or lost. I just wanted to do the challenges. That's all I wanted to do. If I did well, I did well. If I didn't, I didn't. Like, I was just really just happy to be there. I was, it was really pure joy those first couple of days. Yeah, that's how it that's how it appeared to me. And I think when you walked in, I loved your entrance outfit, you know, because it was really drag race themed, like racing well, cars. He, here we go. Here's the thing. That outfit is probably older than drag race that I wore because I wore it when I won Diva Rising Star in 2004. That's how old that outfit is. So I thought because it's Mini Cooper, I had to wear it because it had my name on the back and it's vintage, like me, vintage. Sorry, sorry, um, what was the name, Aubrey? <laughs> no, I definitely, I, I loved the outfit. I thought it fits so well. So, I mean, who cares if it's, you know, a bit old? It didn't look old. It looked like it was custom made for the show. So, you know. It's like me, I don't look old. <laughs> no, you definitely don't. I, like, do you think, because obviously I think when you walked in, everyone knew who you were. They all were really sort of excited and talked about what a, le a legend you are. And obviously that kind of does feed into the whole age thing. So I think obviously you were the oldest on your season. Do you think that played a factor and how did you feel about that? I think what played into the factor was my resume played, not my age. Well, yeah, my age because I've been doing drag for so long, but I'd also done many great things. So when you come into a room when you're in a competition and you have that resume and practically no one else has that resume in that room, what is that? That's automatic competition. And because I had such great rapport with Rue as well, that didn't help as well. So it was like automatic. I was, it was almost like I was a target indirectly for my age because I had that rapport with Rue as well. That's what I think anyway. Yeah, I guess so it I suppose you can't you can't help being so fabulous. So you know. No, exactly. If, if you were me, you'd be fabulous too. <laughs> um, and so when you walked in, um, and then you obviously saw all of the well, eventually all the cast came together once everyone did their entrances. How many of the people did you know from before? The only person I actually really knew was Hannah. And I knew Pamara because I mentored her and foe just from passing. But I didn't know them. What's really weird to me when I watch the show, Pamara talks like we're friends. I have not worked with her. Like I've done two little jobs with her and mentored her eight years ago. And what makes me really sad about that when I talk about mentoring, it's something that I do off my own bat. I have a competition called Drag to Riches where I get 10 young queens in and I give up my time on a Monday afternoon and I give them... I, t I mentor them and I give them advice because normally they go into talent quests and they just get ripped to shreds, but I want to build them up. So it's almost like 
when I'm giving up this time to these kids, if they don't respect that or don't like that, and hence why I said what I said to Pamara, she wasn't very respectful to my time at that time eight years ago. And that's when I knew her was eight years ago. Yeah, because that was one of the things I think on the show, like you said, they kind of, they showed the whole thing between you and Pamara and yeah. the way it came across was obviously there was some sort of tension that Pamara seemed to say that she didn't really know existed between the two of you. I've mentored Pamara in a talent class before and I never said this when I mentored you, I didn't enjoy it. Really? I found you entitled and rude. Entitled? Did Where did that kind of come from? Because from the edit, I don't know whether it was the edit or not, but it kind of felt like it kind of came out of nowhere. We didn't know anything about this mentoring and then all of a sudden it was mentioned. I was a bit confused. Well, of course you'd be confused because it came out of nowhere. <laughs> well, um, what it's actually, the way it all come about is actually quite, really quite sad. I was working with two drag queens and they were actually bitching about Pamara because they had, right? And I'd walked into the conversation and I said, oh, I don't care if Pamara does drag. I had to say she gets paid for it. And it was said and we laughed, Right. As a, I was making, a, I was roasting her basically. And then one of those girls was making costumes for Pamara and was jealous that I'd gone onto the show and told Pamara what I said, but didn't actually tell Pamara what she said. So it's one of those drag queen things. And that's why Pamara's come in with this beef. And I knew she was coming for me because the producers told me. So this is why I'm, that's like the thing with the dyslexia. I was like, what's so funny, Pamara? Oh, it's because I have dyslexia. I don't share that very often. And normally I know, oh yeah, it's real funny, Pamara. No! Talking about yeah. You say you don't share it often. I was like, I've heard you say it like six times. Yeah, but you were in my group. Oh, that's it. For someone with a disability, yeah, that's yeah. super Pamara. offensive. Because I was like, I could say, you know, when somebody's coming for you, you're like, and I don't know, I didn't, deal with that the best I admit 100%. But when you think someone's coming for you in that environment, I was just on the defense all the time, like watching your back. Yeah, I think you could tell there was definitely something going on, but I think we as the audience didn't know any of the backstory. So it kind of just felt a bit out of place or something. Yeah, and if you notice, like even in the first episode where I talk about Aubrey's outfit, when we come back into the workroom the following day, do you notice all of a sudden Pamara's sticking up for Aubrey? Yet Beverly and Aubrey were just saying her outfits were crap. Like, did you see that? I don't know if you noticed that dynamic. Because it's the way it's cut, you don't see all that through line. It all just, all they show is the drama. You just see the peak of it. That's always, I think my thing is always, I never try and make an assumption about a queen based on a reality TV show that's highly edited. I think the whole point is they're going to show the worst parts because it makes the best TV, but that doesn't mean that's actually what happened. Yeah, and because I'm so vocal, because I'm the type of, uh, someone actually pointed it out, they could, they could tell my confrontation was all about trying to get to resolve the problem. I'm all about, because I did, I just want to resolve it. I, I, I can move on once we just go, and I'm not saying I wasn't at fault, but unless we talk about it, if you bitch about someone, you're never going to resolve it, but if you talk about it, then you can resolve it and move on. And I think because in my career, I was very much a people pleaser for a very long time. So what would happen, I would implode. So what I decided to do was always approach conflict full on and uh, head on, sorry, not full on, which was quite full on actually, uh, always approach conflict full on. So then you could solve it and move on. But what I realised is people don't move on. I move on, but people don't. That's something I've learned. Yeah, I, d I definitely think to me, like I said, I didn't make any judgments. I just thought it was it was good TV. And I think just I just took it as face value that we don't know the backstory between you and Pamara or you and whoever. So we, we're we not the ones to judge. But I think yeah, what, I, what I appreciated and I think what other people appreciated, especially maybe an international audience, I think from my personal perspective, I've never been to Australia. I love the country. I've never been, but I, I've always sort of, it's always interested me. But what I think is interesting, I think British culture and Australian culture are sort of quite similar. And we're both quite, I think both countries are quite vocal and we're head on and we're sort of, don't necessarily especially with drag queens are concerned whereas maybe an international audience in america or canada they're not quite the same way especially when they're on tv and i think to me that's why i appreciate you, how unfiltered you were yeah and i think you might be right there and i think we are australians are very but in saying that i've seen some americans on their shows and i think they're much more vicious than what we are like yeah. especially those early seasons especially those early seasons they were like i, I reckon they were going to have punch-ups yeah, I, I think 
definitely because Drag Race has evolved so much because of mainly social media. I think some of the queens are maybe slightly nervous about getting a bad edit and then becoming the villain of the season and getting so much hate online that they're more guarded than they used to be. I'd agree with that, which I didn't go in there thinking that. <laughs> no, I well, mean... Yeah. But don't you find it interesting when I left? I thought the drama got bigger after I left, actually. I think definitely, because I think when you were on, this was just my interpretation, but I thought you were quite funny, to be honest. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know you. Obviously, I don't know you. I don't know the other queens. So I'm just taking it as a person on a TV show. But I think yeah, when yeah. you were there, you were, to me, the person that people would make jokes about, you know, the mini curse of everyone who has an argument goes home. And it was always, you were always the one person that came back to you. So when you left, there was not that one person to blame anymore. Isn't that, and it's funny that you've hit the nail right on the head. Because exactly, because even after I left, I was spoken in every episode after I left. And that's why I'm the most spoken about Queen on Reddit is because for some reason, even they made me the focal point. Like even um, Bolly saying, oh, if I put the sash on Minnie, she's going to turn. And then I look at Miss Cooper and sorry, but I'm going to have to give it. I don't want her coming for me next. I wanted to give it to Minnie. Girl, if you gave it to Minnie Cooper, I would have had to protect you. I don't know, Molly. I've never met her. Where have you come up with this? this, this making me out like I'm this big thing that I'm going to come in and I'm going to turn. And if you put the, put the sash on me, it's an acting challenge. Let's see how we go. <laughs> it's like I found that all super. But that's playing a game, though. That's setting up a narrative to, to the audience to make the audience believe that I'm this monster. Yeah, I, I personally never really bought into that. I just thought... I just took it at face value that it was just a bit of fun on a TV show and you're all drag queens at the end of the day. It's not be RuPaul's best friends race. And isn't it funny? Initially, I took it all like that, but then it started to, when it kept happening, it started to get very dark for me because I felt like I was being isolated in the end, which wasn't fun because I'm up for the fun of it. Like I even said to Molly, if you wanted to put the sash on, I mean, you should have done it. It makes for great television. Yeah, well, obviously, I'm sorry that you felt sort of isolated. And I, was, I can imagine that's not, very nice. What's your relationship like with the Queens now, sort of after the show? Have you could have resolved any of that or? Yes, I have like, mm, yes, I have totally. The, you believe it or not, one of the people I get along with the most is Beverly. Isn't that a surprise? But I think the reason why Beverly and I get along so much, because our experience was very similar. Because when I left, she sort of became the target. And I, it is funny that you said that. And I think, I don't think it, it's almost like a psychological thing. People have got to direct it somewhere. So who's the, oh, we, we haven't got Minnie anymore. So, and it did, it went to Beverly. So let's see who's nervous now. If you've got something to say about me, say it to my face. I already said it to your face just two minutes ago. But just stop, please just stop, stop telling me how to act, Hannah. I'm, I'm so not sick stop. of it, f off. And I really felt for, I, I would watch Beverly on the show and I actually really felt for her. And then we spoke a lot prior to her elimination, we became quite close actually. And the other person I'm quite close to is Yuri. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree what you said about Beverly. I think she kind of became the new mini or whatever, uh, if you can call yeah. it that, uh, which was obviously sad. And it, I mean, it makes good, good TV, but as an audience, you have to remember that there's a real person behind that person on TV. They Like they have feelings and... Yeah, and like it's funny how they say they didn't know Beverly. I think Beverly does know who she is. She's just young and she's still trying. She's just, I think about if I was 20, I said to Beverly, we did a radio interview prior to the premiere, and I was in, it's the first time I'd actually seen her. And we were chatting. I said, Beverly, I said, I could not have done it at you at 21. I said, I couldn't do it at 50. I said, what you've achieved was really amazing at 21. Like, you've got to remember that. Like, I really felt for Beverly. I really did. Yeah, and I really liked Beverly. I thought she was really fun, and she brought the she brought the drama, but also she was just really in interesting. She was funny. She had good looks. I I really enjoyed her. So I I felt bad for both of you because you both seemed to get a slightly like the villain edit, if you can call it that. Yeah, I think so. And I think the thing with Beverly, she also was too was unfiltered. <laughs> She, whatever she's feeling in that moment, she just expresses what she's feeling in that moment. And I'm very much like that. And you, your feelings, especially in drag race, your emotions go like this. Like within minutes, you can be on this high and then you're in the lower slow within seconds. It's like so weird.
Definitely. It, I mean, it really is a drag race. It's a race because it's a pressure cooker environment and they, yeah. they're trying to get you to do something crazy because it makes good TV. And they got, got it. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly got it in spades with you. Um, yeah. Going back to sort of the your sort of your run on drag race, if we talk about sort of the different challenges. So obviously on the first day, you have the entrances and you then do the photo shoot, which was the sizzling sausage or whatever it was called. And you actually ended up winning that challenge, uh, the mini challenge. What was that like? Oh, my God. I was having the best time. with And because they only show you like a good minute of that. I had Rue in hysterics. Like, because Ru had tweeted my name years ago with Minnie Cooper, drag queen name of the day, and I was talking about that. And he goes, I'm never going to get a word in Edgeworth. So it's, it's not about you, Ru. It's about me right now, Ru. <laughs> so, I, and I just think, I don't know if it's an age thing or we're of the same ilk of drag, but we were just laughing our heads off. Like, we really had a really great time. I really loved the photo shoot. It was really fun. Yeah, you were really fun in the photo shoot. And you, like I said, I think. From my pers- from my perception, I kind of got the I think with Rue, because he's normally the oldest in the room, because he, you know, compared to a lot of the contestants, whereas you and him aren't too dissimilar. I mean, you're younger, but too dissimilar in age. Yeah. I think he probably saw you more as a peer rather than someone on his show. And he's the mother and they're the children, I think. And it's interesting that you say that. I know I'm jumping ahead here, but the thing with Rue asked me about Beverly at the table. So, uh, how are you doing with the other girls? What I found really interesting, that Beverly and Pamara were saying they got along on the catwalk, and then but the first thing that Beverly came out of her mouth when she sat down is they didn't. Right? I'm just talking to Rue like a person. Isn't that weird? Like, and, and, I'm, and it's weird for probably for people to hear me say that, but he asked me the question, and I answered the question like, you're talking to a friend. And I do regret saying that now because I wasn't in, it's so funny, I wasn't looking at it like the way that the other guys were looking at it in that moment, which I can see it now, which is really interesting. Because whenever I spoke to Rue, it was always really comfortable and it spun them all out. Like my Snatch Game walkthrough was hilarious. Like had him in stitches. There was another one, we did an acting one. We did a walkthrough for the acting challenge. And I just had, we were just talking to Aubrey at the table about her costume and we made up. And Rue had brought it up. I said, oh, Rue, I don't know why Aubrey's so upset. I said, when I started drag, I was told I was unwatchable. <laughs> and he goes, oh, you should release an album called Unwatchable. I said, yeah, I can't wait not to buy it. So yet again, we had that great rapport and chemistry with each other. Yeah, I, definitely. I think you always seem to, I think out of everyone, you and Rue seem to have the best rapport because, like I said, I always felt like when I was watching it, I felt like I was watching two people that were almost on the same level as friends because it may be the age and the experience rather than a mother talking to her children, which is the way that there's you, that relationship is normally. And probably Rue did have a bit of respect for me as well. Do you know what I mean? Like be, being a person of age, probably did that was a way of Rue showing respect as well because it, it is different. It just, it, it's ageism in many ways. Like even talking about the younger people is ageism. Like it comes in so many different factors. And but I, I mean, I always thought you you were really funny. Your walkthroughs were always really entertaining, and Rue obviously felt the same way. Um, yeah. So in episode one, obviously, so you won the mini challenge, and then the main challenge was the design challenge using sustainable resources or whatever. From you know, it was all basically random materials. What did you feel about that when you heard that was the challenge? Oh, panicked, but glad it was the first challenge because I knew that was going to probably be the challenge I'd struggle at the most, actually. So I was sort of glad it was the first challenge because you only have to be better than one other person. You only have to be better, and that's all That's all I'm thinking. I only have to be better than one other person, and I'm fine. And it was crap. Like, what we had was crap. Like, there was no material. And I, I unbeknownst to Beverly, I actually did learn how to sew. Um, and I went to actually, it was freezer bags, and I went to sew it and it started to rip. So I thought, oh, I'll just staple it together because it'll hold it together better. That's why I said, I think it's so funny <laughs> that you see me stapling away. <laughs> but it's all about just getting a garment, and everybody was using leaves. So I thought, oh, I don't want to be doing leaves. Everyone's doing greenery. So that's why I chose freezer bags. Yeah, no, I thought you. I, it was when you were stapling. I thought it was so funny because I haven't. Re- I've seen people hot glue and soap, but stapling's a slightly new one. I just thought that was. I just thought that was funny in itself. 
<laughs> but I really and, liked, I liked your outfit. I thought it looked good. It was like space age and like, you know, maybe the construction wasn't quite the same standard as a seamstress would make, obviously, but that's not, you're not a seamstress. So what, what do we expect? Yeah. And it was also, cause I went to iron the fabric as well and it started to melt. Cause you know how it had all those creases in it. So I couldn't iron it to get the creases out. So there was all things that I can see that are wrong with the garment, but you sort of go, well, it is what it is. I've made the, I've made a shape. I've got them dressed. The TV was the best idea I think ever. <laughs> I, the, I remember when you walked out, because we obviously hadn't seen that much of each queen, but that was, was the first episode. But when you walked out, I thought at first I was, I saw the outfit and I saw you holding it. I thought it was a notebook. And then when you got a bit closer, I was like, she's carrying a monitor or a TV screen or whatever. I thought that was so funny. And I was like, she, it just told me everything I needed to know about Minnie Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, there was some reviews that I read, and I think I posted, I had to prove this, she's completely an utter batty. And I said, you'd be right in saying that. And I think that also comes with age, is taking a risk. Like, I'm not scared to take a risk. Like, the Heelys is another one. I took a risk, did it pay off? No, but it could have paid off. It's yeah. things like that. It, it was funny. You you definitely stood out because, like you said, you didn't use leaves like a lot of other people. You didn't go for necessarily the same silhouette. So I think you definitely stood out. And whether or not your garment was constructed better than someone else, the fact that you made the judges laugh, you were holding that TV screen like a crazy person, but it was it fit with the character. And I thought, well, she's yeah, definitely she's safe. She's not going to go home. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's funny. So it's, people either like the outfit or they hide it. A bit like my time on Drag Race. And I loved it or they hated it. <laughs> but at least they have an opinion, I suppose, which is maybe better than indifference. Yeah, and I think... Well, I was polarising. It's the best way to describe me on the show, and I think that is a good thing. I think at least you're... And it's really interesting talking about... Well, I suppose my style of drag is a very... If you like my style of drag, you like old-fashioned kind of drag because it is a, a very much of a glamour period of Hollywood. Yeah, I really enjoy that because it, you, your style of drag reminded me of a lot of the drag queens I've seen in the UK. So that, mm. that's why I think I warm to you because you... You were that kind of funny, slightly campy, but also almost like old Hollywood sort of style in a way. And I quite enjoy that. Yeah. And that's where I get, because I grew up watching Hollywood movies when I was a little kid with my mum. So my aesthetic very much comes from that old Hollywood glamour. There's always a sense of glamour in everything. Even my clown had a little bit of sense of glamour. <laughs> yeah. Well, like your outfit today. You know, I love that, you know, the little feathers there. Yeah. Very old Hollywood. Yeah, absolutely. An expensive old Hollywood too. <laughs> <laughs> but still drag, still drag. Yeah, totally. Uh, and so obviously, yeah, so you were saved the first challenge and then the second week was the acting challenge, was the prison acting, acting challenge. Uh, and you, I, your character I thought was really funny and I think you totally sold in. That's why you were quite high, that you placed high that week. What was it like filming that? You know, Did you have any experience in acting and were you quite confident doing it? Yes, I have, because I, I've done musical theatre before and just prior to coming in, and this is something that's very interesting and why my response to Pamara was so visceral, right, and why, because I have dyslexia and I don't, not haven't spoken about it a lot in my life, but I just before Drag Race I was doing a play and I was the lead in the play and on the very first day of the rehearsal I said to the director, I have dyslexia again, and he goes, no, you have to read the script in front of everyone and it was a full, like, the lead and it was embarrassing. I was embarrassed. So here I am reading, and some of it was it went into Shakespeare. So here I am looking at words that I could not read. So I was stumbling and stuff, and it was embarrassing. And because um, we did, I done, had done my video via uh, video. So they loved my audition, but I'd learned it orally. So they didn't realise how I'd learned Shakespeare. I said, well, I, you learn to, when you have dyslexia, there's ways to learn scripts. So doing the acting challenge, that's why I, I said it several times, I have dyslexia, just so people are, because you say it once and it's, it's like it doesn't fall on people's ears, how difficult it is to learn certain things. So Michelle was very kind to me in that, actually, when we were doing the challenge. And because I've done acting before, I just, I don't know, the, the character was really descriptive. And Hannah and I, because we knew each other, We'd actually planned out, that's why when we walk in, if you want to show us what we've done. So we had business, like with the toilet. We'd already pre-thought about our idea. We didn't just come in and no lines. We actually had something to offer and give Michelle and Reese something to work with. Did that answer your question? 
Yes, yes, you did. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I really, I thought you and Hannah did really well. And to me, watching it, out of everyone on in the acting challenge, I actually thought your t- pairing was the most natural. And to me, it felt like watching two friends or two people who know each other who had thought about it and didn't just memorise lines. Out of everyone, I thought your was the best pairing. And that's why we had an advantage. And that pairing happened purely by accident because it all happened so quickly. We, We'd read through the characters and I said, I happen to do anyone. And then they said, Rue's coming through for the walkthrough. So we just picked it. So we didn't even really get to pick our characters really clearly. The only one that really got picked was um, Aubrey's character for the pop star. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I thought, I mean, to be honest, the acting challenges, I always think they can go one of two ways. Either they're really funny and everyone loves them, or they're just really bizarre and the lines are just like weird and, it, it, it's a really mixed bag with acting challenges, I think. I think it's actually you, what with the acting challenges is what the actor brings to the script. Like they're just lines on the page. Any lines can be funny. It is the way you deliver. That's why I think Hannah and I were so good. And even Spanky, it wasn't actually, it wasn't the dialogue. It was the way we delivered the dialogue. Because there are jokes within the script. Even when I was watching people back, I was like, oh, there's jokes in there that you're missing. It all comes down, they, they always say there's no... There's no small roles, only small actors or whatever. Yeah, you know, I it's, agree. It's, I think that your role was funny because you're Minnie Cooper and you, whatever you say is funny because you deliver it in a funny way. So yeah. I thought you you sold it really well. And we didn't have very long to learn the script either. It's only like half an hour. It's like it's really quick. Yeah, that's the other thing about Drag Race is people don't, people always say, oh, you know, they didn't know their lines or in a, in a dancing challenge, they didn't know the choreography. But when you actually think about the fact that you all had to learn that in probably a day or something and then do yeah, it, that's nothing. Super, super quick. And then once you get into character, you're actually not allowed, because everyone's got to have the same amount of time, you're not allowed to look at the script anymore. So when people are filming, you're not allowed to be going over lines. Well, okay, yeah, that's, so that's even harder then, because if you especially for someone like, you know, you've obviously talked about your dyslexia and I can only imagine that that it must be an even bigger challenge on top of the challenge you already have to try and learn lines. That's insane. Oh, it's really insane. Really super insane. Um, and so obviously, you know, <coughs> you did you think maybe you were going to be in the top that week? Because I assume you must have known you were going to be at least safe. Uh, actually, Hannah and I felt really good. We felt really great. Even as a group, we felt really good. I actually was shocked that Aubrey was in the bottom, to be perfectly honest, because I felt like we as a group worked extremely well together as a group. But yeah, then it I, came I down, thought... it was all singular in the, in the end. Yeah, I thought, like I said, I agree. I was quite surprised by Aubrey's low placement as well. I thought she did a good job with the material that she had and the character obviously wasn't quite the same like obviously your you and Hannah were supposed to be these kind of sort of dirty inmates that are a bit gross or a bit whatever whereas her character was supposed to be this princess pop princess or whatever which is quite hard to make funny as opposed to being these two inmates that are on a toilet or whatever it's, it's sort of it's like, yeah inside <laughs> it's one um, bit of the acting challenge that makes me want to go like get all excited because I, I love alcohol and I was obviously dying for the alcohol I was like, so, so, so weird to watch it, it was it was it was a funny challenge and I think it definitely I, I wasn't surprised I thought that you you or Hannah were actually going to be the winners that week I because I thought you two were both really funny mm. I thought I'm very happy Spanky deserved the win though but if it goes on runways as well I think it probably should have gone to Hannah and I that's the other thing is that runways it's difficult to know what what counts is it just the challenge and then a little bit of the runway or does the runway is for 50 percent it's there's no formula i suppose i think it's when it's convenient <laughs> um yes yeah, so obviously so you were you were placed high that week and then so you were safe and you get on to the next week and then that challenge was the bottomless brunch where you had to in pairs do a drag brunch and you had to host it and you were with queen Kong. Uh, so what was that like working? Because you, had you worked with Queen Kong before? No, I had, I did, I'd only seen Kong online and I have always, just the stuff I'd seen online, I'd loved. And um, just working with Kong, we just had such respect. It was super easy. Kong, super, super funny. Kong was really struggling that week, actually, because she'd been low in the acting challenge, so she was very down. So, but... Um, 
I helped her a lot with her presentation, with stopping with the gags. So that's why you see I'm so happy for her when she got that great critique. Because I was like, wow, you did it. Like, you achieved something. Because it's not her thing. To... But I think it's one of the best things she did on the show was the roast. I thought she was absolutely knocked it out of the park. Yeah, it was really... I thought you two were really funny. And I think when I watched it, yeah, she... I thought Kong did really, really well. And it was... You were really supportive. And I almost... For me, I felt like... Uh, the reason I really respected you is because I think you almost took a step back from that challenge and you almost let her shine, which was very nice of you, but not necessarily in the context of the competition is the best decision. Yeah, well, you know what's funny? You've got to remember there was a five-minute set that they've cut down to two and a half minutes. So you've lost to... So what they've done, they've showed Kong's... Because really, I should I be saying, she she's a finalist, so they have to show her growing in the comp. So me, they know I'm going pretty soon. So I saw in that episode, the only thing, I'm not really featured at all in that episode. I just am there supporting Kong. And I had did have jokes. And we did, I thought we were great together. What was one of my jokes to Michelle? Oh, you know, Michelle, I am a woman of age. I have such bad eyesight. I could never tell if it's you or Ross Matthews in drag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, but I, they only show so much. And Kong's jokes were so great as well. So... Yeah, I really, I thought you two were really funny and I think they definitely played up the whole like Mini Cooper talks too much or like, and you were, you were leaning into that as well, which I really appreciated that you were very self-aware and you were making jokes about it and you weren't taking yourself too seriously. Yeah, and that's the hard thing when you watch when people go, oh, Mini should have been in the bottom for that chat. Well, no, I was, my, you didn't see my whole, that's where the, the edit sort of goes, makes it looks like, I've just stood there and done nothing, which I actually did. That's just the edit. Yeah, I, and I also think that you two are quite funny in the sense that you almost did turn it into a roast, as whereas some of the other people didn't. They did it really like a drag brunch. And I think because you two did it very differently and you involved Rue and the judges by making jokes about them, that's why I think I thought you two potentially were going to be the top two. And it's really weird because they were, it was very confusing what we were getting. They were saying it was a brunch, but then they wanted it to be a, like we were given the thing that it was a brunch. Like it's so that it was like we were leaning into and we were getting different feedback from, like there was this thing I always do at a drag brunch where I always people solemnly swear when they come in. And I did it with Reese and I forgot the other guy's name, Chris. And um, they said, oh, we were super uncomfortable while you were doing that. And I was like, then I walked away from that. I was like, oh, no, that's got more to, to do with you as comedians, what you probably would have said. Because like, I was, because I think they were going to say I was going to go make all these horrendous jokes. No, it's just to make sure if I make a roast joke, no one's going to get upset. So I sort of do this item song when you swear. Because drag queens, you make a roast joke and they get upset. It's like, it's super weird. I, if I was there, I wish I was there for the reading challenge. I would have read them all to Phil. <laughs> I definitely think so. Yeah, definitely, you definitely seemed like you weren't afraid to kind of read people, but also I'm sure you were you weren't saying anything that people wouldn't have said at a real drag show when cameras aren't rolling or whatever. Do you know it's different? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I don't know if the young kids really understand what really you see. But I don't know. It's a real tricky thing. I think you get tougher skin being a drag queen as you get older because you get do get read a lot. So I think you tend to build up a. A resistance to being read. So when you're younger and being read, I think it can be a bit confronting for someone like Beverly. Yeah, especially maybe the younger queens who don't have that same experience or haven't been in that world as much. So yeah, I and I can two, see why. But I thought you two did a really good job, and I, I really thought you two would potentially be in the top that week. So again, I think you had a really good week, even though you were safe. I think you were on the higher end of safe as a pair. I think so as well. And then the runway category that week was red for filth, so the colour red. And I, you re you wore that lovely garment and I, I really loved it. It was old Hollywood, really glamorous. And But for you, there was also, you explained on the runway, there was a slightly, there was a message behind it as well. Yeah. Well, as I was saying before, when I was 19, I used to work with the, I used to be around a lot of the drag queens. And there was three particular, there was one Caroline Clark. And Mitzi McIntosh, who now lives in England, she was a famous drag queen here. She used to work with Caroline. And Abby Road, who made my dress, was good friends with Legs and Tallulah. And when I was doing that play, 
it, it, the subject of when I was doing that play that my character had AIDS, so it was really on top of my mind. So when I'd gotten onto Drag Race, I really wanted to do because it was the whole thing of the play was talking about these queens because we don't talk about them; they're just a memory. So that's why I wanted to talk about them on a platform like that to make people go, "Oh wow, there's this story about these two drag queens that died on the very same day," and people actually wanting to find out about HIV in that time, especially kids today. They don't understand that people were losing someone every second day back in the 90s and 80s. Like that, I'm sure, to some of those drag race kids is a shock. So that's what, sort of why I wanted to talk about that as well. Yeah, and I, I thought it was a really good message. And obviously talking about HIV and AIDS is something, like you said, that doesn't get talked about that often. And it should be, especially on a show like Drag Race, which is a primarily LGBT plus audience. So I really yeah. appreciated that. And also it was just a great dress. I really liked it. It was really glamorous, despite the nip slip, which you talked about. But that was funny. Yeah. I liked that. You know what's really funny about that? Um, Legs into a little always used to have nip slips, which is quite funny as well. <laughs> So you were kind of channeling them in lots of different ways. Unintentionally. And so obviously, yes, you were safe that week, but still, but high. And then you went into the next week, which was Snatch Game. Uh, How did you feel hearing that it was Snatch Game? I was excited about Snatch Game because I thought I did. I thought I was going to do quite well at Snatch Game. I really did. But it just, I didn't. I was terrible. I was shocking. Well, I think... Your, I was, when you said Ellen, I thought, because although Ellen's really well known, she's quite difficult to make funny. And in your funny, yeah. crew, you were really funny with Rue, but I I was thinking, is that going to translate to the Snatch game? Because Ellen is quite a difficult person to do. And someone has previously done Ellen in one of the All-Stars yeah, yeah. American, and it didn't quite work. And I was thinking, oh, that's a, that's a tough to make funny. Yeah. But were you surprised? Because obviously you were so funny in your walkthrough and everyone was saying, you know, Rue was Rue laughed the most with you. Were you yeah. thinking that you were going to be okay in Snatch Game? Yeah, exactly. And I think another thing that didn't help was having the alternate occasion with Aubrey just before going on. Because I wasn't, to be funny, you need to be in a happy mindset. When, you're, when you've just had conflict, you're not, you're not in the mood for being funny. The thing that's got me like quite upset is Minnie mentioning my name to Rue. Imagine if I told RuPaul the things you said about Tamara. I would be fine with that because I own my sh**. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't think that helped going in. And because um, I'd sort of taken by Ellen, Ellen from Saturday Night Live. And you know how she's, oh, she's always going, thanks very much, I'm Ellen, which I think is quite hilarious, but apparently was not funny on Drag Race. <laughs> and what, what was it like? filming Drag Race, um, sorry, filming Snatch Game, because obviously the way we see it is with all the the sound effects and all the and the music and everything, whereas I'm assuming you're going to do it to silence, so it's different. Yeah, and when it's really hard, because as a, I thrive off an audience, like that's when I'm at my best, because you get a vibe, you know, when the audience is low, so you know, okay, this is where the audience is, I might need to do this to lift them up. You have no guidelines. You've got silence. So, excuse me, uh, even like if I'd say a joke, it didn't work, I'm very much of the mindset, okay, that's a joke, move on. I don't normally sit in something when I feel bad. I did have one joke that didn't make it because <laughs> um, Rue had been on Ellen with Ellen and they talked about him doing his Lifetime movie with Macaulay Culkin playing his love interest. I said, oh, we looked into Macaulay Culkin and he wasn't available. We looked into Jeffrey Epstein. He wasn't available either. <laughs> I thought that was a funny joke. Not so funny, apparently. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, that's the problem. Sometimes Very dark. It's funny, but on TV, they have to meet, I guess they have to strike a balance of what they're going to get complaints about or whatever. Oh, they had bloody Zaria Chamberlain last year. Yes, that's true. It's... Yeah. So that game, I think, is one of the most difficult because you have to be funny, but also make sure you're not too rude about the person that you're impersonating because that can have consequences. That's tricky as well. I agree with you. Because I did want to, because I did start off doing Ellen as like rude Ellen, but they did they didn't get a yes. <clears throat> they do it was ignored, so I couldn't go along that, right? If you're not if they're not accepting something, you can't in improv, you can't keep going with it if they're not saying yes. That's a no. Okay, move on. I've got to move somewhere else. Yeah. So, were you were you surprised when you were in the bottom with Beverly then that week? Not at all. Okay. 
because yeah, because I, I I thought it could have gone. There were a few different people who I thought could have been put in the bottom, depending on what how you look at it, what the judges wanted, what storyline would work. So I was, and obviously the the runway that week was the Cirque de So Gay circus theme, and yours was really funny because you came out with the Heelys and you were just making this big show, and the judges I don't think quite knew what to make of it. So I thought maybe that would sort of tip you over to being safe, perhaps. Yeah. And you know what is interesting? And this is having, I've thought about this a lot since doing Drag Race. Like, because my my um, uh, lip sync has had a quite a visceral reaction to the public. People hate it. Like, what's she doing scouting, sca- skating around like a clown, right? And then I think, but you're always congratulating people for cartwheeling and doing sublams when it's got nothing to do with the song. So that confuses me. Here I am dressed as a character. I don't get to choose the song. So I figure I'm dressed as a clown, a performer, but that's not acceptable. But if I flablammed and shalammed and did death drops, that would be acceptable. I'm very confused by that. It is difficult because I think also it depends what the song is, what your part, what the lip sync partner is doing, because Beverly did a very sort of emotional. And she was great. I have to say she was really fantastic. I, I do think that as well. So when you did the the lip sync, did you, in the moment and then afterwards, did you think you were going home? Um, what did I think? I thought, God, she must have been good when she's, because this is what happened, actually. Rue goes, congratulations, uh, you stay there. And I go to congratulate Beverly and she goes, ah, like that. And so I go like that. And I thought it was going to be a double shot, you stay, is what I thought. And when she said, oh, Chasse away, that's why I go, oh, wow. <laughs> Beverly Kills. Shantae, you stay. Oh, wow. And it, said, it looks, and I can understand why people think why they think. Right, okay, so it was the, because, yeah, because when on the show, obviously with the editing, it made it look, like you were quite solemn and almost a bit an- annoyed perhaps like by the react and then you went oh wow and it kind of made it look like you were re- almost annoyed but by the sound of it that's not really how it happened no 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 because oh, I thought it was going to be a double Chante you say because I was actually going to give Beverly a hug yeah I, I was I did think it could potentially because it was just so you two were doing so different performances and I think if the song had been different it had been a kind of wacky song then maybe you would have stayed because your movements were kind of more in sync with that but oh yeah I was very... I was doing very camp drag you know in some review I read if they saw it in a club they'd love it because <laughs> yeah. I was because well, what do you do you dress as a clown doing a Lady Gaga this Lady Gaga tortured song how do I it's really hard to perform that when you're dressed like that I, I find it very I've got to perform the way I'm dressed it's really weird yeah, I can see why. And I guess yours was just such a kind of your outfit was just so clown and so camp, whereas Beverly's was slightly more probably fit with the song slightly more because it was a bit more of a sort of traditional glamorous dress. Dress, yeah, yeah. Because I'd be interested in, and it's all just lack of the draw when you get the lip sync song because you don't get to, and that's what I find weird. To me, lip syncing is all about the marry of the costume and everything. To have a fabulous lip sync is when everything marries together. Like the costume, the song, the emotion, all of that. I get that. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, I'm so unfortunate you did obviously get told to sashay away um, and you he lead off the stage, which was really funny. Your exit line was hysterical. And before I go, is this where we do the reshoot and send Beverly home? <laughs> You <laughs> Love you, Kim. Um, and I thought it was so funny because you were almost making fun of production, like the whole show and the concept. You, like it was funny. You were being really, almost slightly not irreverent, but you were kind of calling them out. And like it was, I just thought it was really funny that you were. I think it, we, we all know that happens. We all know because what was the thing? Because we all know that the finale gets shot with three winners. Everybody knows that, and that was sort of my thinking after oh, this where we go back and Richard. I was being, yeah, I think I was being a reverend. I think it was, it was just funny. It was, and I thought it was really funny. And obviously Rue saw the funny side because she laughed. And like, I thought your exit line was was one of the most memorable. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously, so you, with your mirror message, that's another thing that people, because uh, obviously you thanked certain people, but not others. Was yeah. what, what was What was your thinking behind that? Well, because just what you don't see, because whenever I was having conflict with someone, it was always a group 
Acme. So we, that's why I'm also, it's very hard to have a conversation when you're having, when there's a group of people talking at you. And what I've done with the thing with Beverly, which you don't see, is that I ask the group, can I, because if somebody has a problem with me, can just the one person speak to me? Not everyone is a group. And I go, who is it? And Yuri goes, well, it isn't me. And I go, no, I know it's not you, Yuri, and I know it's not Kong, and I know it's not... Um, Spanky. Spanky. Spanky, yeah. And then Beverly goes, and this was something was a, it was a bit of an aha moment. For Beverly goes, it's not me, and the only two left were Molly and Hannah. And Hannah had to put her hand up and say, well, I am one of the people, and Molly said nothing. And then something else happened on the runway, which I won't say, which made me leave Beverly's name off the mirror. So when I've come off, I actually didn't even want to write a mirror message. They actually forced me to write it. And I thought, and in my mind, I'm just thanking the people that were kind to me, but then it looks, then the, and isn't that weird? That wasn't my intention to do that, but it comes across exactly like that. Yeah, it's, and I think it, it can, sorry, carry on. No, 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 that's it. That's all i got to say. So I thank the people that were kind to me and left the people on the mirror that were always having conflict with me. That's why I left their names off the mirror. So do you think, do you, would you think those people? No, I think it's, it's difficult because I guess you, at the time when you're writing the message, you probably don't think about how it's going to come across on TV and how they're oh. going to edit it to make you look like the villain. So then you're almost giving them the fodder that they need in a way. So... Yeah. That's the difficult bit. But at the end of the day, you I could tell you weren't playing a game. You were just being yourself. And I appreciated that. And maybe other people didn't, but I I personally did appreciate that. I've seen things on TikTok where they compare me and Thorgy together. <laughs> yes. That's a really that's a really good comparison because you're both unfiltered and you're both you're kind of you don't take the show too seriously. You're kind of just taking it as if it was any other gig. You're not trying to portray a fictional character on a TV show. You're just being you. Yes, I think that's what it is. It's so funny to watch that Thorgy thing. And I think that's, was I thinking like that at the time? It's so weird. There was another thing I saw where someone says, oh, Minnie can't even look at Beverly. And I was like, no, I actually went to give her a cuddle. But because you don't see that, it's funny how people create a narrative by something that they have no idea what that person is feeling in that moment. That's what I find fascinating. People have created all this emotion around me and what I'm thinking, and it's actually not what I was thinking at all. But then it makes me start to think, oh, if I've got no perception of what I'm what I'm like. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's difficult to know whether you're being delusional or whether other people are just forcing a narrative on you. Yeah, and I found that with a lot of my conflict, people would start to make up, oh, she must have done this and that's why Pamara said that. Actually, no, I never said it. It was said in a private conversation to people that were bitching about Pamara. That's actually what happened. But people said, oh, she said it on a microphone. or People start to make up the narrative of what that is, which I find really fascinating. Unfortunately, Drag Race is one of those things. People are haters are going to hate and you just kind of, you know, you've got to just kind of take that with a pinch of salt and just know what you are and who, like the the, peop, the person that you are, whether it's on camera or not. So I appreciated that. And it, it made for good TV at the end of the day. And they obviously used it for a reason. And without that, I don't think the season would have been as entertaining. So as long as you I, were okay with it and it didn't affect you too negatively, because that's always what I fear for people who get the villain edit in a way. Yeah, if I'm perfectly, I'm fine now. Waiting for the show to air was the hardest part, actually, I was waiting for it to air to what they were going to show. And then when they did, when they didn't show a lot of context was upsetting because you're like, well, if that conversation of what I said there was in there, we, people wouldn't think that. Like, it's, it's, it, that's hard to watch. But, you know, at the end of the day, I signed up for it and I've got to live with that. People move on. People move on. They, people aren't going to... They, they, they live for it for a week and then they move on. Yeah. I That was me. One of my questions was, how did you feel about your edit on the show? I thought... Um, I wish they'd showed things like, you know, what was interesting in the last episode where you see Kong and Spanky thank me. Do you remember how they said, oh, Minnie, they never showed me helping them and lifting them up, which I did do. So they didn't show, they only showed that side of me. They didn't show the other. They only showed one side of me. That's what I don't like. I would be happy if they showed both sides, but they only, but then I think it becomes too confusing for an audience. 
person can, can an audience can someone be both things i don't know if that's too confusing for an audience yeah it's, it's really difficult and the show obviously they push people in the edit that they want to show like you said they wanted to show kong progressing and getting to the final because they knew she reached the final whereas you didn't whereas if you had reached the final they probably would have shown more of the kind of nicer side to balance out the villain edit i reckon you would be right in saying that i agree with that so the name of my channel is Drag Tea Served. So I was wondering if you could serve us some drag tea and tell us something that maybe happened that didn't get shown, something that happened backstage or a moment that you wish had been shown. Which I wish they had shown when Pamara had brought up the thing about I said her drag was bad, didn't she care to get paid for it. Prior to coming here, that's why I heard, I don't mind that Pamara does drag, I just hate that she gets paid for it. I just made a joke, and whoever told you that is very unkind. They are responsible, not me. I mean... That's really... Oh, no, I know I said it. you said it. Yeah, I said it, agreed. That there were other people bitching about her, and what they were saying was much, much worse than what I was saying. So... That bit of conversation, I wish I wish was shown because it makes it look like I'm deflecting. Oh, that person told you was cruel. Well, yeah, it was cruel because they didn't tell you the whole picture. That's what I wish was shown. And so, what? So, you explained to Pamara in the moment that other people had been saying nasty things about her and. Yeah. And what they were saying was much worse. And I won't tell you because it would really hurt you. Right. And it was um, pretty hard. Yeah. And when you were having your sort of, you had a few arguments with like Pamara and also Beverly and a little bit with Aubrey. Were there mm. any parts of it that weren't shown that you think should have been shown to show a fairer picture? Or do you think what was shown was accurate? Um, with the dyslexia, they didn't show me apologising to Pamara. Like I'm um, saying that, that I under, that I understood what, because you notice they were all talking. When... Guys, because I have dyslexia, I don't share that very often. And normally I know, oh yeah, it's real funny, Pamara. No! Talking about it. You say you don't share it often, I was like, I've heard you say it like six times. Because what's weird about the dyslexia one is that you're all saying, oh, I Minnie mean, didn't know, she, she can't take a joke. I was talking and I said, what was the thing? And then you're all talking over each other Oh no, what, 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 what? And then I understood, oh, they were laughing that I said it several times ago. Oh yeah, I get it, I get it, I'm sorry. Wasn't about the disability. No. But it is a disability. No, no, no. no. Uh, I you about, never laugh at I that. You were laughing I about I you hear. saying that I you don't tell. I... And what had happened earlier, Kong had pulled them up for not apologising to me about talking behind my back. So that's when I say, so are you going to apologise to me? Yes, I apologise and say it was inappropriate. Oh, well, I'm very sorry, Minnie, it was inappropriate. Uh, thank you. Thank I you. appreciate that. So there's so much context that I think these things in the moment, that's why, I'm, that's why I'm asking for an apology. Would I never normally ask for an apology from someone? Probably not. But because that was in my mind, uh, they, they're not apologising to me and I'm always apologising. I became the apologiser. Well, I, 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 don't I don't think you had anything to apologise for. I think, it, it, like you said, context is really important. If they cut out the context, it, it changes the narrative. It does a little bit, doesn't it? Um, so I'd love to get on to some subscriber questions, if I may. Um, I we, there were lots of questions for you. Um, one, not Nothing too bad or anything. <laughs> oh, even uh, if they're bad, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, no, I mean... I think most people really enjoyed you and they they were just curious about it. So someone someone sort of said, how has your life changed after Drag Race? Um, it ha really hasn't changed at all. Isn't that weird? Have you seen a sort of an increase in bookings or anything like that? Um, a little bit, but not really. It's really, it's really weird. I thought there would be a lot more, but not really. It's weird. Okay, well, I guess it pushes you to an audience that maybe wouldn't have seen you otherwise, especially an international audience. Well, this is the thing, because I do have a one-woman show that I want to take to separate around Australia. That will be the telling sign when I go to do that, if people buy tickets to come and see it. Yeah, and I guess also if they, like, with when they do the drag race, like drag con and the, the different tours and stuff, obviously I'm assuming you'll be invited to do that, and that's obviously an extra yeah. booking that you wouldn't have got otherwise. Well, this is the thing is that because they've put season one and two together, I've only got to do half the tour. So that's what I mean about we don't, it's been sort of almost like we've missed an opportunity because of COVID. So the tour is on at the moment. I'm just not in it. Right. 
Well, you know, obviously we hope that we will see you in, in some other form. Someone actually, um, this kind of feeds into it. Another question was, would you come back for an All-Stars season? Yeah, I would love to actually because because I felt like there was all this baggage that other people were bringing in where if I, we did an All-Star season, I don't think that would happen. I always think with Queen's, the first season they're on is almost like a warm up and people getting to know you. And then all stars is when they already know you and you can kind of show a bit more sides to you than you had a chance on the first one. Yeah. And I think with someone like me, and I think the audience can tell that there's so much more to the person. Cause I think a lot of people were sad to see me leave the show. I think the show lost something when I left. Yeah. I agree. I, I added something, even if I wasn't involved, there was something about my energy in that room that created something in the show. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think you, when you left, it was definitely, there was a void. And I guess they tried to fill that with Beverly, but then she obviously left as well. So I, they always mm. try and fill that void of who's bringing the drama or who's doing that, but they don't show any of the good side of you actually being really caring and nurturing and things like that, because that doesn't yeah. make good TV. No, it doesn't, which I get. <laughs> uh, someone else asked and we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier someone said a huge part of drag culture is being able to read your peers especially your friends do you feel age is off limits for you and if so why no I don't think age is off limits to read me as long as it's clever okay I think that's fair yeah as long as it's clever like even we made a joke in our when Ruth said um, she was on the Titanic and I worked in the gallows. Like, I can make jokes. Do you know what was it? Beverly and I thought it might have been funny if we were together in the roast. How different, because we could have made young and old jokes together, actually, which could have been quite fun. Yeah, and I think, like, they, like most people say, you can make almost anything funny as long as it is funny. You can make a joke about something as long as it's funny. Yeah, it's, if it's cruel, it's, there's a difference between funny and cruel. If I'm not laughing, then it's not funny. Yeah. Like Spanky yeah. made the joke about um, not being touched for a long time. The <laughs> Like that to me was really, really funny. <laughs> yeah, self-deprecating humour is also a lot easier because I guess you're the target yourself and it's easier to make fun of yourself because you're not offending anyone else. Yes, that's right. Because what was one of my, my favourite roast joke was for um, Hannah. I said, oh, you've done great work the last two years. It's more than I can say for your plastic surgeon. <laughs> yeah, and I can, ima I can imagine, I would think that, because Hannah's got a good sense of humour, I'd, I'd like to think that she oh. would think that was funny. Yeah, she would think that was funny. Um, what was another one? Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, oh, Aubrey's one was, could be she'd left by the time, because... It was actually Yuri had mentioned about her makeup being a bit ashy. And I went, oh, that's a joke there. And I said, oh, we, I know we have a lot of raging bushfires down under, but I don't understand why your makeup is so ashy. <laughs> so it's, yeah, just been, it's been clever with those jokes. That's a typical ro like roast or read in the reading challenge. So I think that's yeah, what totally. you would have played the reading challenge. Yeah, I think I would have. I actually think I would have won the rating challenge, to be honest. I, th I think you would have done as well, because everyone would have been too scared of the mini curse to try and go up against you. <laughs> the mini curse, it was so funny. So funny. That whole mini curse thing. Did you did you know about when they were talking about that, or did you only find that out once you watched the show? I'm not going to be another part of Minnie's Catalyst, because any queen that Minnie fights goes home. I'm not part of that narrative. Not me. I only found out that, and it only happened in the episode, really, I left, wasn't it? Uh, I only found out about that when the show aired, actually. And what did you think about that? Did you think it was funny? And did you sort of I see? Thought, well, I did say, and I, they didn't show this, I said, oh, it seems to be everybody I have conflict with goes home. So I was aware of it as well. Yeah, I think I think it was funny. And I it, it made you memorable. And like you said, people kept mentioning you even after you left. And that obviously speaks volumes. <laughs> Yeah, I think so as well. Like every episode, there wasn't an episode that went past where I wasn't mentioned. So that's that's good, I guess. You know. Oh yeah, I'm happy happens. with that. I was, it means you're still it means you're still on people's minds. Uh, and someone else asked, um, "What moment are you most proud of and least proud of on the show?" The moment I'm most proud of is the AIDS stress. It's the one I'm most proud of, and the. The moment I'm least proud of is speaking about Beverly in front of Ruth. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, like you said, that was one of the moments I was slightly confused because it did, I felt like it came across 
like you said it out of nowhere, but I could understand that you probably didn't even think about it in the moment. Yeah, well, it, it looks like it comes out of nowhere, but Beverly and I had spoken about it in the morning at the morning table because they were holding me to account of talking behind Pamara's back. And I was like, you can't hold me accountable for talking about behind Pamara's back and that's exactly what you're doing right now. Because we all talk, that was the thing that every drag queen talks about everyone, but I seem to have got held to this standard of talking about because I'm Mini Cooper and I'm 50, you don't get to do those things that we as all young kids get to do in the confessionals. That was my whole point. That was, And then I realised Beverly wasn't one of those people which made me feel really bad. Yeah, there's definitely, I think people have very double standards about what's okay and what isn't okay, depending on if you're young or old or what type of queen you are. And Yeah, it's, it's and it looks like I had those double standards as well because it was like here I was saying to uh who was I saying to Pamara and Aubrey? Because they were talking literally behind my back. I was like, that's not acceptable. You can't talk about me while I'm there. That's a bit different. And I was, I think in a private conversation, that's different. But I don't know. Maybe that's just me. We all do it. We all do it. We were, and at the end of the day, it's a TV show. You're in, you're, they want you to do that sort of thing. They deliberately don't let you talk to each other. They take away your phones. They isolate you because they want you to be annoyed or whatever because it makes good tv and they achieved it with me in tenfold <laughs> well i think we all agree that we would love to see you for an all stars or something because i think it would be a great opportunity for you to show yourself again without having like you said the baggage and the narrative that you had on the first season because everyone already knows that about you now yeah yeah totally and you uh what was the other thing and i mean we wouldn't because you know we were in isolation i was in an isolation a month before i even started filming so that's a long time to be by yourself. I, I Yeah, I, I can't imagine what that must be like, especially for the Australian queens, because you obviously all had to fly over to New Zealand to film and you then had a longer quarantine and everything. That's insane. It's insane. Um, and someone else asked, what was the biggest lesson you learned from your experience on Drag Race? What was the biggest lesson that I've learned to think before I speak? <laughs> I think we can all... I think we can all... Uh, uh, yeah, I think we can all understand that. And I, I think everyone probably could have, at some point in their life has said something that they shouldn't have said, but it wasn't on camera on national TV. And I think what I think, uh, what I get out of drag race is that we're all human and we all make mistakes. Like every person, this is what sort of a uh, big realisation I've got it out of, out of drag race is that everybody makes mistakes. Every single every single person in that room made a mistake. Not just me, but for some reason I get, Beverly and I got held more accountable than everybody else for some reason. True, definitely true. And I, I that's unfair in, in a lot of ways, but I think, yeah, that's why I really appreciated you because I almost felt like you were given the villain edit, but then I could tell that wasn't really what you're actually like. So it was an interesting dynamic, but ultimately yeah. it's a TV show. It's a TV Yeah, show. and I get that as well. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd love to get on to my quick fire question round. So these are just five questions that I ask all my interviewees. Um, they're, some of them are drag related, some of them are not, but it's just sort of quick fire, top of your head, your first impression. So lipstick or lip gloss? Lipstick. Yes or no? Pineapple on pizza. Yes. Uh, Favourite emoji? The clown. <laughs> uh, cocktail or champagne? Uh, cocktail. And can you summarise your experience on Drag Race in one word? Here, Lee. <laughs> Thank you very much, Midi. Thank you so much. I really loved speaking to you and I'm sure people have love to hear more like you know your answers to the questions and hear a bit more about your experience um if people do want to sort of hear more about you and follow you online where can people find you you can find me on the instagram on the twitter at the mini cooper and so and, have you got, and, what, and what projects have you sort of got coming up or anything you're excited to tell us about We've got the tour coming up and I've actually recorded a song with uh, Coco Jumbo. We're just getting the film clip together. I'm trying to involve drag queens from all different franchises is what I'm doing. So it's a bit of a project. Great. 
Well, Mimi, thank you so much for being on my channel. I really appreciate it. And I really do hope we see you on an All Stars because I think regardless of whether you were polarizing or not, I certainly was in the love side of it, not the hate side. I really loved you on the show. So I'd love to see you on any form, whether it's at a show or whether it's on another season of Drag Race. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Lovely to chat. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.